class next time. Um, but uh, if you've read that, at least you'll have some background information. So I, I don't have to cover all the background. I can just, uh, you know, maybe, maybe uh, you know, skip into the good part, you know, and, and fast forward through the context. What I want to do today is, uh, first of all, I want to look at the um, exercise that we had last time. You know, I wasn't here Tuesday. Um, last Thursday we had an exercise. Um, I want to go through the, the steps of it and, and recreate it. Um, because again, the, the folks did seem to have some difficulty with it. Um, so I, I want to work through the steps uh, on that one. Depending on the time then, we'll go, we, we might go into our next topic, which is the topic of, of maintaining state. So let me go and pull up the um, example from last time, or the exercise from last time, as we go in and uh, take a look at it. While we're doing, while I'm doing this, and I'm waiting for Visual Studio to wake up the squirrels in the machine to get them to run faster so that it can fire it up, um, we have after today um, two more weeks. And what I plan to do is there's a few things that I I want to cover that I need to cover, but of prime importance is getting your project. Uh, up and running. So I do plan on having some days um, for you to work on your project, which I'd urge you to take advantage of, if for no other reason, to get input from me and your classmates about it, um, help with testing it, um, a lot of different ways we could put that. All right, let's pull up this. If you remember last time, last time we had class, we were to take the example that we had from a couple classes ago and make the following changes uh, to it. Add the faculty rank to the form. Use a drop down to show all available options. And of course the rank should default to the faculty member's current rank. Uh, make the update work. Make a delete button that works, and then add the ability to do inserts using the same, uh, the same form. All right, so let's go in and get moving on that. I believe the one piece I did in lab, um, so we'll kind of skip that part. I'll, I'll talk about it, but. I won't spend tons of time on it unless there's questions. I did also have uh, someone ask the question of could I loop through uh, a data set and create the drop down? You can, but I'm not sure, unless there was some special reason, I wouldn't necessarily want to do it that way. So unless someone is particularly interested in it, um, I won't go over that in class. If you are particularly interested in it, bring it to my attention and, and I can review it with you in lab. All right, so let's refresh my own memory about where this code is.
is really thinking about this one. All right, looks finally looks like something happened. All right, if I remember right, I believe I want this to be my start page, so I'll set it to be start page. And this was the page that I was working on. So let me go and run this and make sure everything works. And then we'll be good to go. For the next two weeks, again, the one, the one big topic that I have to, to talk about is maintaining state, and I'll spend some time talking about that. That being said, you can glance through your book, or, or if you're aware of any kind of functionality that you may be interested in that we haven't talked about in class, let me know, and I'd be glad to talk about that. Or, if there's a topic that you would want to review, if there's a particular topic that you found problematic and you want to review, I'd be glad to do that as well. All right. All right. Indeed, that is the right pages. So let's look at what I did. What I did to do the drop down is I created a data source for it, created the drop down, and then I bound the data source for this. Now, this is the way that you do this even if you're doing it like as part of a grid view or a details view. Remember, there's always like two things at work here. All right? Always two things at work. There's always the source of where you're getting the list of the values to populate the drop down, and then there is the, the data coming from the table that you're maintaining. In this case, we have this. In this case, we have a faculty rank table, all right, that contains a field called F rank, and it also contains corresponds to that person's specific rank. So if they're an adjunct and their code is ADJ, we want to see adjunct in this drop-down. All right? 
So there's always going to be data from two tables involved, at least two tables. But there's going to be the data that is going to populate the list of options. That's going to be from the code table, right? That'll be from the faculty rank table in this case, or whatever the related table is. So that's one way that we're going to sort of bind the data. We're going to bind a data source that contains a list of these to that drop down. We are then going to use the faculty rank field to determine which one of these becomes the selected value. All right. So there's two different things going on here. All right. You wouldn't, for example, pull up just the faculty ranks from the faculty rank table to populate that. All right. Because again, there's what? There's, you know, probably, you know, hundreds of faculty people here at LC. This list shouldn't contain a list of a hundred different ranks, right? Or a list of a hundred ranks, some of which are the same, many of which are the same. It should show a distinct list, a unique list of each rank. Where do you get the list of possible ranks? From the faculty rank table. Now, to be sure, from the faculty table is where you get that person's specific rank. So, with that in, excuse me, with that in mind, let's go back and look at this. I have on the page my drop down. That drop down has associated with it a data source, a SQL data source. If I look at that data source, It'll show me that my select statement associated with this is select F rank, F rank desk from F rank. This doesn't touch the faculty table. All right. Why doesn't it? Because this is simply retrieving the list of options. The list of options isn't in the faculty table. The list of options is in the faculty rank table. So to populate the drop down with the list of options, we use that table. And that's the way it'll be on, on any of these. You know, if you want a list of uh, models for a car, the list of models for the car isn't going to come from the, from the automobile table. It's going to come from the model table. Now, to be sure, the selected value is going to be tied to the automobile's model. But to obtain the list of values, we're going to get that from whatever table contains a list of values. So. That's how we populate it. Then when I create my drop down under configure data source, whoops, under choose data source, I say that I want to pull the rows from that data source. I want the field to display to be the description, right? I want them to see the description because that's what's going to make sense to them. The F rank is simply a code and that may or may not make sense to uh, people. Questions about this? So, that handles me getting a list of all the faculty ranks. That doesn't handle making sure that the selected value in that drop down corresponds to the selected, to, to, to that faculty member's rank. And that we have to look at the code behind the C. If we were using a grid view or a details view, it would do some of that work for us. We could go and create that drop down and do the bindings that way. But since we're doing it from scratch here, we have complete control, which means we have to take complete responsibility for, for doing all that. So what, I'm, what I do in this case is I added to my select statement to retrieve in addition to all those fields that were there before, I'm now pulling the F rank from the faculty table. So that'll give me the faculty rank for that particular faculty person. I then, after I retrieve it, I look to see, where is it? I look to see what that value that was retrieved was, and I use that to select the selected value in the dropdown. So that's the line of code that goes and takes a list of the faculty ranks and selects, makes a selected value 
the current faculty rank for the particular faculty person we're looking for. So we select the, set the selected value of this to the faculty rank we pulled. Now, remember, the, reason, the way we did this is we said that the value of this is going to be the faculty rank code. All right? So that's the primary key to the faculty rank table, and F rank in the faculty table is the foreign key. So we match those up so that it matches up with that, and therefore it will be able to find the selected value. Questions about that? So when we pull this up now, that dropdown contains the appropriate, um, the appropriate uh, faculty rank for that person, and it also contains a list of all of the fields. All right. So now we want to make the, the update actually work. All right. So now we want to make the update actually work. I'm going to go and delete one of the images and rearrange this a little bit. So there's not two images like we had before. All right. Now I'm going to actually make the update work. The update should be as simple of a matter as going in and changing the code that we used on the other example with the student for the insert. All right. So let's go into the code behind for this. I have my button click event. I'm going to paste that code in there. All right. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and I'm going to change this uh, to not create uh, or to still create a, a data source. But instead of doing things with the insert command, I'm going to do the update command. So. Let's go in and change this and let's, we can leave this part the same, this part the same. I don't want to create an insert command, I want to create an update command. All right. The update is now what? Update faculty set. What are the fields I have? First name and last name, okay. Set FF name equal to question mark, right? Because that's a parameter. Comma FL name equals question mark, comma. F rank equals question mark. Where FID equals question mark. That's the general template for the update statement that we would have, right? If we were updating that, we need to say update, the name of the table, set, and then we have pairs of the names of the column and the value. Well, we know the names of the column. Those, those aren't, you know, those are for every update statement that's going to be the same, all right? What we don't know is we don't know the specific values because we don't know what we're going to, to change them to, all right? So we put question marks in. Those are things that are going to get filled in from somewhere at runtime. All right. Where are we going to get that from? Well, the faculty first name we get from Textbox one dot text. The last name we get from textbox two. The F rank we get from.
drop down list one selected value. And finally, where do we get the FID from? It came to us in the query string. These all, by the way, should be update parameters because we're doing an update. And we can go in and try to do, we're not going to try to do the insert, we're going to try to do an update. And if it works, we're going to redirect them back to default.aspx. If it doesn't work, I'm going to display an error and an exception. So let's go and run this now and see if it works. Let's say that Jonathan Blanchard, we spelled his name wrong, it's actually just John Blanchard, and they're not a full professor, they are a associate professor, go and click button, and it saved it, sent it back to there, let's look it up again, and sure enough it shows that John Blanchard is an associate, so we know the update worked, all right? Now, to be sure, we should go and do some sort of validation for make sure there's a first name, make sure there's a last name. Um, I'm going to deliberately leave it out because we should be, you know, it should be pretty straightforward for us um, now. Um, and also I'm going to leave it out because that will allow me to test my exception processing. So if I go in and don't put anything for John and click the button, ooh, it must not be a required field in the database. Right, which it should be. Let me go in and put a value in for that. Let me go and make that a required field. And let me stop debugging. It's not letting me make structural changes to that table because it knows someone's looking at that table.
I'm going to go in and require the first name. So let me. I think it opened it read only. We'll test the exception logic when we get to the deletes. Right. Okay, questions about this. The idea here is once you sort of get the idea of how the code for an insert works, updates and deletes work just about the same, except instead of an insert command, there's an update command or a delete command, and so on down the line. Really the only one that is different is a select because the select in addition to either succeeding or failing actually returns um, some data and it returns possibly more than one row of data whereas an update either works or not. It affects X number of rows it's likewise with a delete. But with a select statement when you do a query you actually are retrieving several rows and therefore you might have to loop through them. Therefore, you need to create yourself a data set to, to hold the, a result set to hold the results of the query. So, let's go in and let's make ourselves a delete button. So, I'll label that one update. I'll label this button delete. and I'll write the code behind behind it. Now, this is going to look awful familiar, except I am not going to create an update command. I'm going to create a delete command. Now, what's the delete command look for this? Delete from faculty. Where? FID equals some parameter. So I can get rid of these other parameters. Oops. And I can create a delete parameter and add the FID from the query string. Finally, I can call OBJDS delete. All right. And if there's an error, I probably should change the text of that. Can't delete. Can't update. All right. So now if we try to pull someone up, Now if we try to pull someone up, it is not liking something. Notice it's not giving me an error though.
closed down the browser completely. Let's try it again. I'm not sure what's going on. I'm going to go and reboot this machine. We'll let that go for a while and we'll try to get back in. The last step that we have to do is uh, create the insert and by now you should sort of see the pattern. All right. Um, in all these it works about the same. You create a, a SQL data source, you create an instruction, a command, you supply parameters to that command, you then go ahead and attempt to execute that statement and you have Air, ca or air trapping uh, around that. That's really the way that, that um, updates, elite, uh, deletes, and, and inserts work. Again, about the only one that sort of breaks the mold of that is the select statement because the select statement returns a bunch of data. So we have to handle that one a little bit different. While this is rebooting, uh, time for a commercial. All right. Next Wednesday, all right, um, at 6 p.m. over in Spitzer, I think it's Spitzer 207, there'll be a discussion of the new mobile software development curriculum. And that might be fun to go and listen to. So. Um, you might want to consider um, attending that if, if you have any availability uh, during that time frame. Um, I believe it's in Spitzer 207. Um, don't quote me on that. Well, it'll be about an hour presentation. We'll talk a little bit about the new program. Uh, and we have a guest coming in to talk about uh, his experiences in mobile development. Next week is actually NEOSA, the Northeast Ohio Software Association's uh, Tech Week. So there's actually something going on on Tuesday as well. Um, there will be a presentation in, um, what do you call that, the main building, uh, the College Center building, uh, around noon, which is going to show a recording of uh, a, a conference with IBM where they talk about big data. All right. Um, In the 143 class, we talk about the, the difference between data uh, and, and information. Data being the, the raw facts and information being something meaningful that you glean from uh, the facts. 
And that should always be on our mind as we're developing applications, that we're not simply going to create um, mounds of data and just spit it right back. We need to, when we, when we produce output, and, and even again, even in think in terms of, of your project, when you produce output, it should be arranged in a way that's meaningful to someone so that they look at it and say, yeah, okay, you know. Um, like I say in my 143 class, it would be useless to show a librarian a list of every single book that's ever been checked out, all right? It'd be useless to show a librarian a list of every book that's currently checked out. It may be even be useless to show a list of overdue library books, although we're getting warmer. Right? But if you show maybe a list of books that have been overdue for more than a week or more than a month or whatever, <laughs> then you start getting to something that the librarian can actually use to do their job, something that they can take action on. All right? Something that's meaningful as opposed to just spitting out a, a pile of data. So that should always be on our mind. Now anymore, you know, the, 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 uh, the volume of data uh, in the world today is, is tremendous. Um, I think they're using that Watson, that, that computer that played uh, on Jeopardy, uh, as sort of a centerpiece for this. Um, and I've read articles that discuss mining uh, social media sources to get meaningful information about your product or whatever. In other words, you know, you see that, you know, 10,000 people are talking about your product on Twitter. Is that good or bad? Well, I don't know. Depends what they're saying, right? Well, there's a mass of data out there, but again, it's a pile of data. Um, so they're, they're looking at mining tools that can go and maybe have some sort of artificial intelligence, you know, that can look to see, you know, and maybe make evaluations based on is this positive, is this negative, uh, or whatever. So again, you know, big data is, is a big thing and being, uh, and it is always a premium to be able to um, take and, and understand the data and being able to put it in a, in a meaningful form, all right? That's really, you know, our job. Everything we do about our job largely is taking the raw facts, things that happen, and doing something with them so they can be used to do something else. You know, and, and that really flavors really everything that we do. Okay, we get to watch it make the solution again for 15 or 20 minutes. And then we can try this one more time. Now, the next thing we do after we verify that this indeed works is that we are going to create an insert for this. Now, can someone uh, give me an idea of maybe how the insert's going to work? All right. We're going to have an insert button, right, to, to say to go and insert data uh, into the database. But coming into the program, if I want this page to be able to handle inserts, updates, and deletes, what am I going to need to be able to differentiate between? Well, whether I'm bringing in an existing row that I want to update or potentially delete, or whether I'm inserting a new one. How are we going to be able to tell what mode we're in? Whether we want to go in and insert a new one or um, update or delete an existing one? Yes? Well, there, there is no, uh, there is no uh, uh, um, d uh, details view or grid view on this one. So there really is no such thing as those modes. But you are right in one respect. We're going to do the same thing that we did when we had details mode and we put it in either not read or, or edit, but uh, edit or insert. So how do we tell which one of those two uh, modes to go into? We tell based on, yes? Well, we set parameters. Yeah, well, we, we tell based on whether there's something on the query string. Whether we pass that uh, page um, a field on the query string. If we did, we know that they're editing and we set the page up in that mode. If not, then 
We don't, and we're in insert mode. So as this wraps up, we can test that and we can get on the insertion. Why do I hear Scotty from the original Star Trek saying, I don't think it has enough power, Captain? <laughs> this keeps up, I will entertain you with, I don't know shadow puppets or something. Okay, there we go. Maybe. All right, let's set this guy as the start page. And let's run this. At the presentation on Wednesday, we will discuss how, you know, every 14-year-old in Lorain County probably has a more powerful CPU in their pocket than this guy's CPU right here. Uh, so it'll be enlightening. Ah, there we go. Yay. So we click that. I click on the delete. And... It can't delete because, again, there's probably some foreign key constraint. But at least it tried to delete it and, and got an error. Uh, let's go and try the other guy. See if we can delete Philip Brown. Yep, we can't. Let's see who I can delete. All right, looks like person one does not have. So let's go in. And there is no faculty person one. Let's enter in a new one. All right, there it went and deleted me. And now if I search for Z's, no Z's. Okay, so now finally, let's go in and let's add the insert capability. Now, the insert capability, um, we have the same form, all right? The difference is, is if it's an insert, we don't want to go and do this on the page load. All right, in other words, if, 
there is no value in the query string for request ID, then we can skip this code altogether. So, another way to say, say that is I'm only going to go into edit mode if there's something on the query string. All right. So I will say if I almost wonder if this has a virus or something. Because I mean, man, the IntelliSense is even going slow. The length is equal to zero, or no, if the length is greater than zero, then we want to do this. Otherwise, we want to be in insert mode. Now, in insert mode, what do we want to populate stuff with? We don't. We just want the form fields to be blank. But we don't want the delete and insert, oh, I'm sorry, the delete and update buttons to be visible. We only want the insert button to be uh, visible. Now, we haven't put the insert button there, but when we do put it there, we're going to want it to be visible. All right. So let's go on the page and let's create an insert button. give it a proper name. The text I will say will be insert. And I will make it initially invisible. So, if we are in insert mode, I want to make button one invisible, button two invisible, and finally button three visible. I then want to code for my insert button, which the code will look a lot like this code. Except I will go in and say, set the insert command insert into faculty. FL, F, F name, FL name, faculty rank, values, question mark, question mark, question mark. These three things become insert parameters now. And finally, I do my insert statement. And we should be OK. Again, we use this something very similar uh, when we created a details view that could either be an insert or edit mode. We looked to see if there was something on the query string, and we set the mode on the details view. This is a little bit different because since we're doing everything ourselves, we're 
going to skip populating the fields if it's in edit mode and we are going to um, show and hide the, the different buttons appropriately again depending on what mode it's in. So let's go, oh the other thing I have to do is I have to put a link on this page to the um, insert mode which will simply be going in and creating a link and not passing anything on the query string. So I'll create a hyperlink here and the text I'll say will be insert and the URL will be faculty edit with nothing on the query string and we should be good to go. So now I go and run this. I come up with an insert. we get into the form. Oh. Object reference not request. Uh. I'll use this method and said this should not give me an exception. Okay, so I click insert. All right, there we go. Blank. The other two buttons are not enabled. And I can go in and type in Paul Norad. Assistant professor, click insert. All right. And if I look, there he is. And now when I go into edit mode, we see his information with the appropriate thing. And the insert button is disabled and the update and delete. I will upload this for you to review it. I do apologize for the technical difficulties. I think that sort of broke my concentration for a minute and focus. So I hope. Uh, what I said uh, made sense to you, but if not, you can you can always go through and review this. Let me let me paint uh, a picture of the last few weeks of class. Um, state will be a big consideration that we'll talk about. That's really one of the things that um, we need to be able to do to make a full-blown application. Um, again, as far as other topics go, I can always come up with something. I do want to give some time devoted to you working on your projects and I'm also interested if there's anything specifically you want me to see cover, whether it be reviewing something, uh, maybe something that you're running into difficulty with in your project or just something that, that, you, you know, that you're interested in that we haven't talked about like maybe Ajax or whatever. I would encourage you to, to show people what you're doing in lab, to, to show them just to get a sense and, and you can help each other out that way. I want to spend a minute setting the context for state so when we come in next time we can sort of hit the ground running between my little introduction today and the resources I gave you. All right. The idea of state is like this. I've said and, and you know you can Google it and you'll find a million web pages that make the statement that HTTP is a stateless protocol. All right. What does that mean? That means that the protocol, in the HTTP protocol, every request that the client makes to the server is pretty much a standalone request on its own that isn't really tied to any other requests, per the protocol. All right. So I go to Google and do a search. That's a request. 
I go back and search for something else, that's a brand new request that really isn't associated with my pre previous request. All it knows is that this IP address requested a search for such and such. Then a minute later, the same IP address. There's nothing necessarily unless, there's nothing built into the protocol that links those two uh, things together. All right? So that's the one statement. My one statement is that um, the protocol itself is stateless, which means it doesn't remember anything that happened in the past. Each request is standalone. Yet our experience tells us that that's not, that can't be the whole story. All right, I won't say that's not true, but that can't be the whole story. Because someone remembers something in web applications, right? Because if I go and log on to Angel, and go and do a few things. I could check my email for this class. I could go grade stuff for another class. I could go and add a quiz for a third class. Throughout that whole time period, it knows that it's me. I don't have to log on to every single page. Thank goodness, right? That would be horrible if I did, all right? So here, it almost sounds like I'm, as they say, talking out of both sides of my mouth, right? In one statement, I say there is, each request is a standalone request. In another breath, it's clear that obviously something remembers what happened before because you're not asked to log on every time and, and it has memory of the stuff that you've done. So, sort of the answer is, is that it's not something that's built into the protocol but there's a number of ways, number of techniques that you can use using stuff on the client side, stuff on the server side to achieve what's called state management. So state management is a way of working around that particular feature of the protocol. So the protocol itself doesn't implement any sort of memory of those, but through our coding on the server and maybe some coding on the client even, we can do some things to remember stuff that happened before. And that's the whole thing about state management. We've already seen a very, very basic primitive form of state management, a very simplistic form of state management. And that is when we pass from one page to another a value on the query string. All right? In other words, if we go and look at this, I do a search pulls up Paul Norod. If I click edit, Paul Norod's on this page, all right? If I click edit, that page knows that I want to edit Paul Norod, not someone else. Well, right there is a form of state management, right? Because page one and page two somehow talk to each other to say, hey, you're looking at Paul Norod and you clicked his edit link, the second page then will pull up Paul's information so I can go in and edit it. Now in this particular case, the state is maintained via the query string. So passing data on the query string is a form of state management. In effect, it's remembering what happened before. It's remembering that I clicked on a link to edit Paul's data. All right. I guess another way to describe state management is how to pass things between different pages. Okay, so in this case, from the search page to the edit page, I passed the ID of the person I want to edit. And, and that pulls that person up and I can go then and edit them and everything should be okay. So the query string is one method to pass things between two pages. All right, but there's other techniques as well. The query string is very effective if you're talking about passing stuff simply from one page to another. If you want to remember something for a longer period of time, the query string probably would be uh, fairly difficult to implement that. So other techniques are used to remember, like for example in the case of Angel, the whole amount of time that you're logged on. It remembers who you are without passing your ID on the query string. All right. Another way of state management is instead of using the query string, use the forms collection. And what is the forms collection? It's the, it's the difference between saying get and post in your method, right, of your form. On a form you can either specify get or post. If you say get, it will be 
the, the values that you're passing from the one form to the other will be on the query string. If you say method is post on a form, you don't see the values on the query string, but it gets passed as part of the request, as part of the form collection. So that's the second way. Next week we'll pick up on some of the other ones, uh, some of the other methods, and, and talk about their respective values. All right. Uh, specifically, we're going to focus on session variables. And to talk about session variables, we're first going to have to define what a session is. All right. Uh, what starts a session, what ends a session, and then finally what session variables are, what we can use them for, and what we probably want to avoid using them for. All right. But that will be Tuesday's lecture. All right. Any questions at this point? All right. We'll see you up in lab.